Jeremy didn't care about his ailing daughter or reflect on his family. I'm in Australia with my lover, so I'll come back after the funeral. Then, let's get a divorce. Jeremy, who was playing around with a woman instead of coming to his daughter's funeral, made me so angry I saw red. Seeing me like this, my other daughter, Sarah, nodded and said, Mom, go for it. My name is Eileen. I am a working mother in my late thirties. I really want to be a housewife, but society isn't easy, so I work remotely. Even though Jeremy's income isn't small. Combined with my income, we make more than the average household income. But our expenses are so high that we struggle every day. That's because our daughter Nicole, who is in upper elementary school, has medical expenses. Nicole has a rare disease with few cases, and she has been fighting it since she was little. Insurance-covered treatments are one thing, but I want to try various treatments, so I spend a lot of money on unapproved treatments overseas. Treatment is very difficult, and we have to manage her health to travel abroad, so it's not easy. We, parents are struggling financially, but it's even harder for Nicole. Despite having a clearly smaller body than children her age, Nicole fights her illness bravely. She sometimes pretends to be strong, telling me, I'm okay. Even though she's still a child who wants to be spoiled by her parents, she looks mature and cares for adults, which makes me want to cry. But since Nicole is doing her best, I can't afford to be down, so I grit my teeth and endure. Jeremy was initially supportive and tried to encourage Nicole. But gradually, he started to change. He began to hesitate to pay for the treatments he used to fund for Nicole. Another expensive treatment? It's not going to work anyway. Let's stick to insurance-covered treatments. He started saying things like that. It's true that Nicole's condition is fluctuating. No, it's getting worse. But if we do nothing, it will only get worse, and we might lose Nicole. I want to try various treatments, but Jeremy thinks regular treatments are enough. There's no right answer, and whatever choice we make, we will regret it when the time comes. Still, I chose to take action and give Nicole new treatments. Regretting not doing something is worse than regretting doing it. Those words drive me. Even if I'm blamed for being selfish or people give me cold looks for making Nicole suffer, I still want Nicole to live. Even if her disease has no established cure, I want her to live even one more day, one more minute. That's my way of showing love, and no one can deny it. It's not something strangers who know nothing should comment on. Nicole also understood my feelings and followed the treatments without complaining. She tried her best. Jeremy's eyes grew cold as Nicole weakened. It's useless. I don't know how many times he said cruel things. Along with Jeremy's cold attitude, our marriage went down. We didn't divorce because we couldn't afford it. Jeremy probably found it troublesome too. He provided minimal living expenses but started staying out more. I wished he would at least spend time with our other daughter. Yes, we have another daughter, Sarah. Sarah is two years older than Nicole and in middle school. Since Nicole's illness was discovered, Sarah has felt lonely many times. When we went abroad for treatments, we left her with my parents, and we couldn't go out or travel as a family. Her grandparents took her out and traveled with her, but Sarah always seemed lonely. Recently, she's become more mature as she entered puberty, but she's still a child. When I apologize to her, she says, It's okay. It's for Nicole. But I know she's just being strong. Even though I know, I can't do anything, and it frustrates me. But I can't neglect Nicole either. Caught between my two daughters, I suffer, but Jeremy doesn't care. It makes me angry that he's even cold to healthy Sarah, but Jeremy doesn't seem to care. Sarah has given up and barely talks to Jeremy. 
As Jeremy continued not coming home, the rift in our family grew. Even though he provided living expenses, he stopped paying for treatments. I had to increase my work hours out of necessity. It's a good time to earn with remote work, but there are limits. And with Nicole's care, I have almost no free time. I don't even have time to make Sarah's lunchbox. One day, I woke up to find Sarah making her lunchbox by herself, which surprised me. Do you need a lunchbox today? Oh, yeah. There's a field trip. That's... I'm sorry, you should have told me. But mom, you're busy, right? You look so tired. It's okay, I've gotten good at cooking lately. Sarah said, smiling and holding up her lunchbox. Tears welled up again at her brave figure. Both Sarah and Nicole are trying so hard in their own ways. As a parent, I must keep going. Every time I felt like giving up, I reminded myself of this. But Jeremy was different. One day, when he hadn't been coming home, he suddenly returned late at night. It had been a long time, and he only said, I came to get a change of clothes, and went to his room. Hey Jeremy, at least show your face to Sarah and the others sometimes. It was late at night, and both daughters were already asleep. I hurriedly said this to Jeremy, who seemed ready to leave again after grabbing his clothes, but all he said was, You are annoying. Annoying, they're your daughters too. I don't need a sickly daughter. Could a father say that? I felt dizzy with anger. How can you say that? She's doing her best. It doesn't matter if she's trying if there are no results. I can't believe you're wasting money on that. Calling her that? How could he refer to our daughter that way? I was furious at his cruel words. How do you know if it's a waste or not? It's obvious. It's a rare disease with no established treatment. It's like you're just using Nicole as a guinea pig. That's horrible. Jeremy, who once loved me, married me, and cried with joy when Nicole was born. That person was nowhere to be found anymore. Where are you going? I called out to Jeremy, who was heading to the door with his things while we were still talking. Where else? To my woman. Your woman. It's no fun being with an old, tired woman like you. I give you living expenses, so you have no right to complain. I'll live how I want. You're leaving your family for infidelity. It's your fault. No, your fault and the kids. Playing the victim despite being the offender, Jeremy left. All I could do was cry silently so the kids wouldn't notice. Even though Jeremy was cheating, there was nothing I could do now. I didn't have the time. It was frustrating, but I was actually helped by the living expenses he provided. I wanted to use my income as much as possible for Nicole's treatment. Amid all this, Sarah said, I want to play basketball. She had tried it out in middle school and really enjoyed it. Her face, as she nervously asked, was filled with anxiety. Money was tight and serious club activities would cost more. But Sarah had been patient as a sibling who needed special support. I think this was the first time Sarah had expressed a selfish desire since Nicole's illness was discovered. I felt sorry but also happy that she expressed her wishes. Of course, it's fine. Really? But there's travel expenses for games at other schools, basketball shoes, and equipment. You've been patient for so long. It's okay. Honestly, it was tough. I wondered where I would get the money. But there were government subsidies and help from my parents. I had set aside money for Sarah's future, but if not now, when? I decided to use as much of my earnings as possible, if necessary, I'd get approval from both my parents and Sarah to use the funds. In front of me, Sarah, who had asked, still looked anxious. I realized I had made Sarah endure so much. 
I had made her feel guilty about expressing her desires. At that moment, Nicole, who had been listening to our conversation from her bed, spoke up. Sarah, do it. Nicole said in a weak but strong voice. What? Nicole? Sarah asked Nicole. Nicole, with tubes in her arms and wearing an oxygen mask, smiled and repeated. I want to see you play basketball, Sarah. Nicole. So, Sarah, go for it. Okay, thank you, Nicole. I'll get strong. Yeah. Nicole nodded and fell asleep. Watching her sleep, Sarah murmured. I'll do my best. Tears streamed down her cheeks. The days passed. It was busy and hard, and Nicole's condition stayed the same, no, it worsened. She gradually became unable to get out of bed. She should be hospitalized, but it wouldn't change her condition. At Nicole's request, we treated her at home, but my exhaustion increased. The recent treatment we tried didn't show good results. I knew Sarah still felt lonely. Even so, I started making her lunchbox for her weekend practice. When I handed her the lunchbox, Sarah smiled so brightly. Jeremy still rarely came home, and even when he did, he only threw cold words at us and never had a proper conversation. But both Sarah and Nicole were trying their best. I couldn't afford to be discouraged by Jeremy, so I kept pushing forward. One day. I did it, Mom. Nicole. Sarah came home, bursting into Nicole's room with excitement. What's the matter? You're out of breath. Mom, I get to play in a game. Really? Yeah, it's just a practice game, but I'm so happy. You worked hard, that's amazing. When I praised her for her hard work, Sarah's smile shone even brighter. Nicole, who was listening, also smiled and said, That's great. I want to see your game, Sarah. Of course. It's just a practice game, but if we get permission, anyone can watch. I might not play the whole game, but come see me even if it's just a little. Okay. How long had it been since I saw such happy smiles from Sarah and Nicole? I was so happy, I laughed and cried. However, a few days later, Nicole's condition suddenly worsened. She didn't get better by the day of Sarah's game, and the doctor didn't give permission, so we couldn't go to the game. I'm sorry we can't go. It's okay. Mom, stay with Nicole. Okay. Do your best in the game. Okay. Sarah left for her game with a worried expression. Nicole will get better soon, I told myself. We'll watch Sarah's game then. But that was just a wish. Wishes turned into impossible dreams. Nicole's condition only worsened, and she passed away in the early summer at the age of 12. She never got to see Sarah's game. I cried and cried and cried. We hugged and cried in the hospital with Sarah and my parents. I clung to Nicole's body and screamed. No matter how much I cried and screamed, Nicole wouldn't come back. After I had calmed down, he appeared. Yes, Jeremy. Where were you? I called you so many times. I was busy. You were with your lover, weren't you? It's none of your business. Since Nicole was hospitalized after her condition worsened, I had called Jeremy many times. When it became critical, I left messages hoping he would come to see her one last time, but Jeremy never responded. When he finally showed up, he just glanced at Nicole's lifeless body. Well, the burden is finally gone. What did you say? I said we don't have to waste any more money. What did you say? I couldn't forgive him. That comment was unforgivable. I grabbed Jeremy by the collar, but my parents stopped me. You only gave us the bare minimum for living expenses, not even enough for her treatments. Be grateful you got anything at all. Cheater. 
It's your fault. This was the worst. Arguing in front of the deceased was the worst thing we could do. And Sarah was watching. How is this man a father? The man I once loved was gone. The father of my daughters was gone too. Make the funeral arrangements. I'm busy. I wouldn't leave it to you anyway. Even when I lashed out at Jeremy as he quickly tried to leave, he didn't care. He just laughed lightly and walked out. After that, it was busy and tough. My parents helped, but I had to do things that couples should do together all by myself. I was so busy that I didn't even have time to grieve, and the funeral day arrived quickly. Until then, Jeremy would occasionally show up, but he would just fiddle with his mobile phone without doing anything. It would have been better if he wasn't there at all. I thought, and then Jeremy went missing. Hey Sarah, have you seen Dad? Well, I haven't seen him at all today. He was such a nuisance during the preparations, and now he's missing on the day of the funeral. I wondered if he was panicking because he didn't have funeral attire. It was possible with him, I thought. When my phone vibrated. It was Jeremy. Hello, where are you? The funeral is about to start. After a slight delay, Jeremy responded. Oh, I'm in Australia, so I can't make it. What? Australia? Do you mean overseas? Where else would I be? I'm on a trip to Australia with my lovely girlfriend. Now that I don't have to spend money on the family, I can afford some luxury. Today is Nicole's funeral, are you out of your mind? Oh, I'm perfectly sane, more than ever. Why is he so high-spirited? I couldn't believe the situation and held my forehead. What do you mean you don't have to spend money on the family anymore? Obviously, because we're getting a divorce. What? When did you decided that? I decided when Nicole passed away. No, no, we need to discuss and go through procedures for a divorce. And you're having an affair, so you'll owe compensation. I'll give you the house, so no compensation or child support. What? It's not that simple. It's simple. I'm done with you all. So, I'm going to enjoy Australia with my cute girlfriend. With that, Jeremy abruptly ended the call. That lousy man. I couldn't shout loudly because of the location, but I clenched my mobile phone and screamed quietly. Mom, was that dad? What did he say? It was very difficult to tell Sarah. But I couldn't keep silent, so I explained the situation, and Sarah was astonished. Dad is the worst. I felt like I saw flames burning behind Sarah. Mom, Dad is hopeless. Give him a thorough lesson and then divorce him. Sarah nodded as she said this. We put off the detailed discussion for later, and the funeral began. It was somber but proceeded smoothly. The moment I held Nicole's ashes, I broke down crying again. Sarah cried too. You did well, Nicole. It felt like the Nicole in my memory was smiling at us. A few somber days later. I got a message from Jeremy about the date he was coming back. So, it was time to execute the plan. I told Jeremy the place and time to meet. Jeremy, excited about getting divorced and remarrying a young woman, showed up looking completely elated. I wanted to pull that face, that cheek, really hard. But now was the time to be patient. Hey! Here it is, the promised souvenir. The divorce application form. Jeremy said, thrusting the divorce papers at me. He had already filled out his part. I took them without expression, glanced at them, then looked intently at Jeremy's face and said, So you're alive? Huh? Of course, I'm alive and well, unlike sickly Nicole. Oh, that's it. I couldn't hold back anymore and reached for his cheek. What the hell? 
Don't you dare talk about Nicole. Wow, look at that cheek stretch. Must have been loose from all the cheating. I've been living as if you didn't exist, thinking you were already dead. Divorce is perfectly fine with me. Oh, really? Then sign the divorce papers quickly. But let's take care of this first. I said, turning towards the building I had specified as our meeting place. What, is it another funeral? Yes, it was a funeral hall. I turned to Jeremy, who was looking suspicious, and said, What are you talking about? It's your funeral, of course. What? Your funeral has already started. What? What do you mean by that? I told you, I thought you were already dead. No, no, I was just in Australia. I didn't expect you to be alive, so I went ahead and started the funeral. Went ahead. You started my funeral because of that. Didn't you contact me to arrange this meeting today? I thought I was contacting a zombie. A zombie? Jeremy's eyes widened in shock. He really looked like a zombie. I can sign the divorce papers, but first, we need to finish your funeral. Come on. Wait. Where are we going? I told you, it's your funeral. Hurry up. Ow. Don't pull my cheek. With that thick skin, it shouldn't hurt. No way. Dragging the wailing Jeremy, I pulled him into the building. His name was written at the entrance, and Jeremy was speechless with shock. A funeral for someone who's alive. Nowadays, people have living funerals, so it's no problem. What? I pulled the stunned Jeremy into the hall. There, a grand altar with a large picture of Jeremy was displayed. That's me. Of course, it's your funeral, so your picture is displayed. No, but I'm looking completely bug-eyed. I searched hard and found the weirdest face you made. Why a weird face? Because for a ridiculous memorial photo, a ridiculous face is just right. And over there are the attendees. I pointed with my hand. When Jeremy looked in that direction, he was shocked again. Dad, Mom. Eileen's dad and Mom too. And Sarah. Wait, even my boss and colleagues are here. As I've said many times, it's your funeral, so naturally, they're here. This is a joke, right? If you think it's a dream, shall I pinch your cheek? No, thanks. When I moved my hand as if to pinch his cheek again, Jeremy protected both his cheeks with all his might. Now, we will begin Jeremy's funeral. First, my father-in-law, Daniel. I looked at Jeremy's parents. Daniel stood up silently, looking very displeased, no, downright angry. Dad, why are you participating in this farce? You fool! I'm ashamed to have a son like you. Eek! Daniel yelled into Jeremy's ear and then returned to his seat. Thank you. Next, my mother-in-law, Mary. Next, Mary stood up. She also approached Jeremy and said, You idiot! Don't ever come back to the house again. Whoa! Jeremy covered his ears at the louder shout. Thank you. Next, my dad. There's more! Jeremy's eyes filled with tears as I continued calling names. He was pale from the insults from all the parents and relatives. Of course. It's your funeral. You're kidding! No, I'm not. I answered shortly and continued calling names. After the relatives finished. Now, we have the company representatives. Jeremy's direct supervisor, the manager, please. What? Even my boss? Don't make me repeat myself. When I reminded him it was his funeral, Jeremy turned even paler, almost white. 
the manager said to Jeremy, leaving your sick daughter and family to have an affair. Jeremy, you're demoted. Demoted? We have a vacancy at a branch on an island in a certain state. The previous person returned to the main office because they couldn't stand being alone on that island. You're going to replace them. It wasn't a question of whether he could go, it was an order. Jeremy's eyes widened in shock. Then his colleague said, You're the worst. Don't ever talk to me again. With cold stares, they spoke, and Jeremy's spirit was completely crushed. By the time the last person finished speaking, Jeremy was sitting on the floor in a daze. No, it wasn't the last person, there was still one more. Finally, from me, your wife. I said, squatting down in front of Jeremy. Jeremy looked at me with vacant eyes, so I smiled and said, I've had enough of you. Go to hell, you despicable man. Saying it with a smile makes it more powerful. Jeremy trembled with fear. Then someone else squatted down next to me. Dad. It was our daughter, Sarah. She also had a big smile on her face. Sarah. Dad was wrong. Please help me. Sarah smiled at Jeremy's words. Dad, after the funeral, there's the cremation. What? No, I'm still alive. Good for you, Dad. Your rotten character will get a proper overhaul in the afterlife. What? No, I'm still alive. Sarah ignored Jeremy's words. Someone as terrible as Dad obviously goes to hell. I wonder if demons exist. You should go get tormented properly. Wait, Sarah, your eyes, your eyes aren't smiling. You're serious. Cremation? Am I going to be cremated? My life is over? Help me, Sarah. Why? What? Jeremy clung to Sarah, begging for help. Sarah stood up and looked down at him coldly. Why should I help a father who didn't help his family? But we're family, right? Family? Hey, mom, you're getting divorced, right? When Sarah asked, I nodded. Yes. Look, the divorce papers are all filled out. I showed her the divorce papers that I had already completed. Satisfied, Sarah said. So, you'll soon be a stranger. She deliberately used formal language. Jeremy, now beyond tears, finally broke down crying. Everyone, please prepare for the cremation. What? At my words, everyone stood up simultaneously. Jeremy raised his head with a strange cry. He was surrounded by relatives and company associates. Wait, this is a joke, right? It's no joke. I think you deserve to be burned in the flames of hell. I reached out to Jeremy. Please, forgive me. Help. Hands reached out one after another. Seeing all the hands reaching for him, Jeremy finally fainted. Pathetic. These were the first words I uttered at the meeting with the lawyer a few days later. Fainting from something like that, you're really pathetic. Even when I laugh, Jeremy's facial muscles didn't move. It seemed that the Jeremy's funeral prank had completely drained his spirit. To the lawyer who calmly stated my demands, Jeremy responded with, Yes, yes. In a lifeless voice. Thus, our divorce was finalized in my favor. The house became mine as compensation, and our joint assets were split in half. From his half, Jeremy had to pay child support for Sarah. As a result, Jeremy was left with no money. When it came to discussing visitation rights with Sarah, I turned to Sarah, who wanted to be present. Jeremy's eyes suddenly lit up. Sarah! Even if we're divorced, you're still my daughter. You have a duty to support your parents. 
I'll allow visitation, and in the future, you'll take care of me. What a selfish thing to say. As I was about to respond, Sarah moved. Dad. Yes, what is it? If you want, we can meet once a month. I won't meet you. What? Jeremy tilted his head as if he didn't understand what was being said. Sarah repeated. I won't meet you. You hardly ever came home before, so I don't want to see you now. I won't meet you again, Dad. Sarah continued. So I won't take care of you. What? Don't say that, please, Sarah. Before I could say anything to Jeremy, who was being overly persistent, Sarah raised her hand and waved it dismissively. Goodbye, Dad. Forever. Jeremy slumped in defeat, having nothing more to say. After that, Jeremy became my ex-husband, and I successfully received the compensation and child support. Jeremy was demoted as the manager had said. If he had refused, he would have been scorned by everyone at work, so maybe it was for the best. It seemed that his mistress had dumped him too, and he was lonely on that isolated island branch. He called once and asked, Would you and Sarah like to come visit? I replied, The signal is bad, and hung up. We would never see him again. Sarah and I started a new life with renewed spirits. The sadness hadn't completely faded, but Sarah's presence was a comfort. Sometimes we would quietly reminisce together, but Sarah smiled more, and I felt relieved. I went to cheer on Sarah at her basketball game. Keep it up, Sarah. You can do it. When did she get so good? She wasn't a starter but was a solid rotation player, and seeing her play made my heart swell. From the second floor seats, I cheered her on, and Sarah looked over at me. When I waved, she widened her eyes. Was she embarrassed? I realized it wasn't that after the game. When I went to congratulate her, Sarah grabbed my shoulder excitedly. Mom! I saw Nicole earlier! What are you talking about? I tried to dismiss it, but Sarah shook her head. I saw her! When I heard your voice and looked up at the stands, Nicole was standing next to you, waving at me. It was probably a dream or a vision. It would have been easy to say that. But I believed Sarah. Because I, too, had felt Nicole's presence beside me. Sarah, amazing! I thought I heard a voice suddenly. I looked beside me instinctively. But no one was there. When I looked back at Sarah, she was also looking at my side. Then Sarah nodded. Yes, Nicole. I did my best. At that moment, the wind blew. Dad stumbled awkwardly but managed to walk down the aisle. He looked Robert, the groom, straight in the eye. Take care of my daughter. Dad's eyes clearly conveyed the message, even if he didn't speak the words. I promise to protect Nancy for the rest of my life. Robert understood Dad's feelings and responded with determination. I wish Mom could see me in my wedding dress from heaven. I lost Mom to cancer when I was in elementary school. Since then, Dad raised me and my two sisters as a single father. The wedding reception went smoothly, and finally, I read a letter to my parents-in-law. Daniel and Karen have always been kind to me. I lost my mom to illness when I was young. Because of that, I might have always longed for a mother in my heart. You two have welcomed me warmly, like your own daughter. At that moment, the lights went out, and the entire room was plunged into darkness. Thinking it was a technical issue, I looked up to see the doors open, revealing a bright light and a smiling woman's face. Mom. My name is Nancy, a 31-year-old office worker about to get married. I lost my mom when I was young. When I was in third grade, mom was diagnosed with cancer. At that time, I couldn't grasp the gravity of a parent getting sick. 
I just thought it was a bit lonely because the house felt quieter than usual when I got home from school. Dad ran a long-established auto repair shop in our town. He would leave the work to his young employees and take me to visit mom in the hospital every day. You came here again? Thank you. How was school? Mom's gentle face was always the same, even in the hospital. I learned much later that mom was undergoing chemotherapy, losing her hair, and it was painful just to sit up. Still, she forced a smile to keep me from worrying. Dad would inform mom ahead of our visits. We're coming. So, mom would put on a wig and lightly apply makeup before we arrived. In my memories, mom was always beautiful and bright. Mom, get well soon. We have a class visit next week. I hope you're better by then. Yes, and you be good with your sisters and don't fight with your friends. Of course. I have homework, so I need to go now. I thought these ordinary exchanges would continue forever, but two weeks later, mom passed away. Dad was so busy with the funeral arrangements and relatives that he had no time to grieve. Why is everyone wearing black clothes? Mom is sleeping a lot. Why won't she wake up? My twin sisters asked innocently, and I didn't know how to answer, so I remained silent. From that day on, whenever Dad was busy with work, I tried to act as a substitute mom for my sisters. Despite his exhaustion from work, Dad would always say, Is there anything I can do? I'll do anything. He took on the house chores willingly. After washing his dirty socks by hand, Dad looked at Mom's portrait and said, Mom had it tough every day. I realize that now. But I couldn't bring myself to smile at Dad's efforts. When I was in junior high, Dad tried to iron my uniform with clumsy hands. I can do it myself. Don't touch it. I snatched the iron from him. On my birthday, Dad made beef stew. Don't bother. Mom's beef stew was never this bad. I ran to my room, ignoring my hunger. Later, I snuck out to check on Dad and saw him eating the stew he made. Barbara, what should I do? Dad asked Mom's portrait, his back looking heartbreakingly small. Still, I couldn't face Dad openly. Every time Dad forced a smile, it painfully reminded me that Mom was gone. Since Mom passed, I never saw Dad shed a tear. Watching Dad struggle while pretending to be strong was unbearable, and I started avoiding him. In high school, I used my sisters as an excuse to cut off social interactions with friends. Eventually, no one invited me anymore, and my only company was my sisters. This is fine. I'm fine with this. Without relying on others or interacting with them, I began to believe it was normal to do everything alone. After high school, I gave up college to help with the family finances and got a job at a local company. Sorry. If I earned more, you wouldn't have to struggle, Nancy. Dad lamented his inadequacies as a father. I didn't get a job for you, Dad. I replied coldly, avoiding proper conversation with him. Though I felt guilty, I couldn't muster the courage to face Dad. Ten years passed, and my sisters found jobs. By then, I was 30. Colleagues teased me. Any plans to get married? I gave up on that long ago. I always laughed it off. The only man who invited me to dinner was Robert a colleague who joined the company at the same time. I've been interested in you since I started working here. Thinking about you at work keeps me motivated and performing well. Please go out with me, with marriage in mind. After dinner, Robert's sudden confession surprised me. But it also made me happy. I had only ever thought about my sisters and never seriously considered my own life. I never imagined my heart could flutter like this. The excitement lasted for days, and I couldn't sleep. 
At work, seeing Robert distracted me. Hey, you're not working. And my colleagues noticed my distraction. I confided my confusing feelings to my sisters. Nancy! You finally fell in love. Who's the guy? Is he handsome? Tell us more about him. They eagerly probed, and I was taken aback. He must be handsome. Yeah, your face hasn't stopped smiling. You didn't realize, did you? With their observation, I realized my feelings for Robert were love. I accepted his proposal. Six months later, after a fireworks show, Robert proposed again. I look forward to our future together. I tearfully accepted. Mom, is it okay for me to be happy? To live my own life? I gazed at my engagement ring under the night sky, reassuring myself of my happiness. As fall deepened and the leaves turned, I nervously visited Robert's parents. Relax. My parents aren't as strict as you think. Robert's parents were both public servants. I took a deep breath to calm myself. Are you Nancy? Oh my. I see. You're Robert's fiance. This must be fate. After my introduction, my parents-in-law looked at me with shining eyes. Hey, stop staring at her. It's rude. Sorry. We're just thrilled to have such a wonderful woman with Robert. Forgive us, Nancy. Indeed. Robert inherited my non-existent charm with women. It's a miracle someone as lovely as you would marry him. Enough with the jokes, you too. You're embarrassing me. As Robert said, his parents were friendly and easygoing. I felt I could get along well with them. Then the doorbell rang, and Karen went to answer it. They're here. The house became lively as more people arrived. Oh, you're Robert's future wife? An older woman, who looked like Daniel, entered. Sorry to startle you. This is my sister Linda. Daniel apologized with a sigh. Soon, more relatives filled the room, making it crowded. This is Anthony, a university professor. And Jennifer, whose husband was elected to the city council last month. What was supposed to be a greeting turned into a family gathering. Seeing me overwhelmed, Robert gently held my hand. Are you okay? We can rest in the next room if you need. No way. Everyone took time off to meet you. The main guest can't leave. How rude. The relatives laughed loudly, and Robert sighed. Oh, speaking of manners, women must have children after marriage. How old are you? I'm 30. Oh dear. If you're planning to have kids, you should hurry. Linda, stop it. Imposing your views isn't right these days. Daniel complained with a grim expression. That's not true. All of my relatives had kids in their 20s. If Nancy wants to be accepted as part of this family, she needs to show results. Understood. I'll do my best. Linda, leading the relatives, said whatever they pleased and left with satisfied expressions. On their way out. I'm sorry, Nancy. Robert apologized. Were you surprised? I didn't nod or shake my head, but inside I was bewildered. You'll have to deal with people like them more often, but they're not bad at heart. So, when we get married, I want you to live here with my parents. I understand. I intended to do that when I agreed to marry you. I forced a smile to hide my true feelings. From that day on, I started visiting my in-law's house every weekend for wedding planning, trying to fit in with the family. Each time, the relatives would come over in what they called bridal training. There will be many city council members among the guests. Make sure to think carefully about the food and wedding favors. Don't be stingy with money. Understood? 
They spoke to me as if scolding an unruly child. When Christmas came, far more relatives than I had anticipated showed up at my in-law's house every day. Nancy, you know this, right? Think of this as the final test before marrying Robert. The morning after Christmas, I felt a bit feverish but still took the initiative to serve and help with the food. No matter how hard I tried to act before being told, Linda and the others never praised me. Even so, I wanted to be accepted as a member of the family as soon as possible. Reflecting on the days I spent taking care of my younger sisters during my youth, I kept telling myself, I can endure this much. However, as I was about to head to the kitchen to serve coffee to new visitors, my vision blurred, and I found myself staring at the wooden ceiling. Nancy! Get a hold of yourself! Hey, Nancy has collapsed! Oh my goodness! Robert, call an ambulance right away! My parents-in-law's frantic voices gradually faded away. When I woke up, I saw the white ceiling of a hospital room. Nancy? Oh, thank goodness, you're awake. Karen said, tearing up by my side. What happened to me? I couldn't immediately understand why I had been taken to the hospital. It seems you were mentally exhausted. The doctor said you should recover soon if you rest for a while. I see. I'm sorry for causing trouble. Ashamed of troubling my parents-in-law, I tried to get up. No. Rest now. Absolutely no pushing yourself. Karen, speaking like a scolding mom, gently pushed me back onto the bed. Why did you push yourself so hard? If you were feeling unwell, you should have said so. I wanted to be accepted as a member of the family as soon as possible. But, I guess I'm not doing very well, am I? Hearing this, Karen started to say something, but then the hospital room door opened. Nancy. Are you awake? How do you feel? I'm really sorry for causing trouble. What are you talking about? You're not causing trouble. Just think about yourself for now. Thank you. The warmth of my parents-in-law's words touched my heart. Earlier, I firmly told Linda to stop meddling in our family matters. She's very sorry now. Family. That's right. Nancy, you're already a part of our family. There's no need to worry. Daniel smiled. Exactly. To us, you are like a real daughter. Yet you seem so formal with us. I'm sorry. That's it. You always become so formal with us. It seems you feel like there's a barrier between us. You're right. I'm sorry. I'll be more careful. There you go again. Karen smiled wryly, as if exasperated. Just then, Robert came in. All the relatives have left. They've all realized they put too much pressure on Nancy. As I listened to Robert talk about Linda and the other relatives, my heavy heart began to feel lighter. They're really not as bad as you think, Nancy. Yes. I'll try to get along with everyone as soon as possible. To do that, Nancy, be honest with your feelings. Don't be too formal with us. We're family. That's right, Nancy. From now on, think of us as your real family. Feel free to consult with us about anything. Don't try to handle everything on your own. Moved by my parents-in-law's warm words, I couldn't hold back my tears. Karen gently hugged me, stroking my head like a real daughter. Karen, please teach me how to make your delicious soup. When I was discharged, I decided to treat Karen like a real mom. Of course. I'll teach you our family's secret recipe. Let's make it together. With Daniel, I was initially unsure how to interact not having faced a real dad before. Relax and take it easy. 
think of me as Karen's servant. Daniel joked with a smile, making me less nervous. When Linda came over and saw me, she asked, How are you feeling? Are you okay now? Showing genuine concern. Thank you for your concern. I'm okay now. Good. That's a relief. Linda patted her chest in genuine relief. Though she didn't apologize directly as she was leaving. Use this. She handed me a discount voucher for a nearby cafe. As Robert said, deep down, everyone was kind-hearted. After finishing the soup and cleaning up, my parents-in-law called me to their room. When I entered, there were several cardboard boxes containing old photo albums. Oh, here it is. Karen, look, everyone's so young. Nancy, take a look. Daniel opened an album and showed me an old, yellowed photo. In it were young Daniel and Karen, and to my surprise. I let out a voice of surprise. What? To two unexpected people. Is that my dad and mom? I exclaimed, recognizing their faces. Yes, that's your dad and mom. How? How did you know each other? Daniel and your dad, David, were classmates in middle school. They drifted apart due to work after getting married. Wow. That's so unexpected. And now I can tell you, it was me who introduced Barbara to David, who wasn't good with women. Karen laughed, reminiscing. Daniel pulled out a rusty cookie tin from the closet. These are all letters David wrote to us. The envelopes and letters had faded with time but the familiar handwriting was undoubtedly my dad's. The letters dated from just after my mom's passing to just after my engagement to Robert, totaling over 50. I never knew dad wrote so many letters. I was surprised by this side of dad, who I thought wasn't much of a letter writer. One week before Barbara passed, we visited her. She was instructing David on cooking, cleaning, and laundry. I never knew that. David had always left the housework to Barbara, focusing on his job. He was frantically taking notes from Barbara. Karen's voice, mixed with laughter, turned somber. After Barbara passed, David struggled. Nancy, he felt you wouldn't open up to him. He was always clumsy. After Barbara died, he must have been worried about how to connect with his daughters. But Nancy, believe this, David always put you and your sisters first. Dad. I'm sorry. I knew Dad had tried hard for us. But I couldn't be honest with him, always rebelling. The latest letter simply said, in large letters, Take care of my daughter. Beside the words was a smudge. David must have been so happy. Imagining you in your wedding dress, he must have written that letter with tears in his eyes. I thought from the bottom of my heart how grateful I was to be born as dad and mom's daughter. And then summer came, and the wedding day arrived. According to my sisters, dad was so nervous from the morning that he couldn't eat breakfast. Dad kept looking at mom's portrait and repeatedly prayed, Please let the wedding go smoothly. Dad, that outfit doesn't suit you at all. Is it your size? Have you gained a little weight? Your pants aren't going to rip during the ceremony, are they? Enough, you guys. Uh, I need to go to the restroom. Watching dad and my sisters interact, I casually remembered when mom was still healthy. If only there was one more person here, how wonderful it would have been if mom could be here too. I wish I could have shown my wedding dress to mom in heaven. The ceremony began, and Dad, with a hesitant step that almost made him stumble, managed to walk down the aisle. He looked straight into Robert, the groom's eyes. Take care of my daughter. Though he didn't voice it, Dad's eyes clearly said it. I promise to protect Nancy for life. Robert responded with strong words. Then the ceremony and wedding reception proceeded smoothly 
and it was time for me to read my letter. Daniel and Karen have always been kind to me. I lost my real mom to illness when I was in elementary school. So, perhaps I always longed for a mom in my heart. Both of you welcomed me warmly as if I were your own daughter. At that moment, the lights in the venue suddenly went out, and the room was enveloped in darkness. I thought it was a power outage, but then the doors in front opened, and a giant screen lit up with a bright light, showing a woman smiling brightly. Huh? Mom. The image was of my late mom. Is it recording properly? Are you filming this? Yes, it's working. I think. Which button do I press? I heard Dad's voice, unchanged from the present. David, get it together. Oh, Nancy. Can you hear me? Mom in the video waved at me with a beautiful smile. Is Dad doing the housework properly? He's not slacking off, is he? Are the kids studying diligently? Dad is clumsy, so he might be causing trouble for the kids, but please take care of yourself and do your best at work. From the family seats, Dad shouted, I'm doing just fine without you telling me. And the venue burst into laughter. And Nancy, if you're watching this video, does that mean a wonderful prince is by your side now? Nancy, congratulations on your wedding. Groom, thank you for marrying Nancy. Since Nancy chose you, I'm sure you're a wonderful man. Groom, please take good care of Nancy for a long time. I will. Robert promised firmly. And to the groom's parents, I have a request. My daughter has no mother. So there may be shortcomings. But please watch over her warmly. By the time this video is played, I won't be in this world. But my only wish is for Nancy to be happy. Please fulfill that wish for me. I'm counting on you. Mom's voice trembled with tears. Nancy, absolutely, absolutely, absolutely be happy. I'll always be watching over you from heaven. Dad's face filled the screen as he filmed. I'll take care of our daughter. With Dad's strong words, the video ended. When the lights came back on, Robert stood up. He took a deep breath and, facing my mom in heaven, said, I promise to make Nancy happy. No matter what happens, I will always protect Nancy. The venue erupted in applause and cheers, and the wedding reception ended. My parents-in-law came to the waiting room. Actually, Barbara entrusted us with that video when she was alive. She asked us to show it when her daughter got married. But we never imagined the groom would be our Robert. Daniel and Karen laughed heartily. Having become Robert's wife, I moved in with my in-laws, and now we live together like a real family. Since then, with my in-law's support, I've made it a point to visit my parents' house once a month. The house, which became surprisingly quiet after the three daughters left, welcomed me with Dad, whose hair had thinned a bit, smiling awkwardly. I haven't prepared anything, but I can make some tea. As Dad boiled coffee in the kitchen, Don't be so formal, we're family. I said, rubbing his shoulders. Nancy. For you to say that to me. Dad seemed to have become more emotional with age. And guess what, I'm pregnant. By this time next year, you'll be a grandpa. Even such trivial conversations made Dad sob. I, uh, oh, um. Overwhelmed with emotion, I couldn't help but cry too. Both Dad and I, and my in-laws, are eagerly awaiting the day when a new family member joins us. Mom, watch over us from heaven. I'm going to build a family as happy as yours. And Mom's portrait smiled gently as always.